Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss an influential work of New Testament scholarship. I'm Laura Robinson. I'm Ian Mills. And we are PhD candidates in New Testament at Duke University. This is our Christmas episode. It is our Christmas episode. Merry Christmas, Ian. Merry Christmas, Laura. So in keeping with our tradition, three years running now, we are going to discuss another chapter from Raymond Brown's The Birth of Messiah. Uh, We're going to return to Matthew this year. Last year we did Luke and the year before we did Matthew's. And we're going to talk about a really characteristic feature of Matthew's uh, nativity story and a really characteristic uh, feature of his gospel, which is the story of the Magi. In Matthew chapter one, there's the genealogy, the annunciation, and a one sentence birth narrative. If you're interested in the genealogies, as you should be, you can go back and listen to our episode 15, where we first discussed Raymond Brown's book. And then chapter 2 kicks off with the Magi, which is what we're going to discuss today, the first 12 verses of chapter 2. And then there's the flight to Egypt, the slaughter of the innocents, and Joseph and Mary's return to Nazareth. So Matthew chapter 2 starts us off by situating the narrative in Bethlehem. It tells us that Jesus has been born in Bethlehem. And it looks like, especially when you get to the end of chapter 2, this is where Mary and Joseph live. Bethlehem is their hometown. Yeah, in verse 22 in Matthew, when Joseph and Mary are trying to come home from Egypt, they want to move back to Bethlehem, but are afraid to because of Herod Archelaus. Um, So they instead move to Nazareth. Uh, If you want to know more about Jesus' hometown in the Nativity Stories, you can listen to last year's episode number 27 on uh, the census in Luke's Gospel. Herodotus, one of our first people to in Greek literature to use the word magi or magus, and he describes the magi as a class of Zoroastrian priests. Zoroastrians, that's a dualistic religion uh, that's still practiced today among Persians um, from the from what we now call modern day Iran. This class of priests, he tells us, began under the Medes. And there's some literary evidence to suggest that this group of priests, the Ma- Magi, uh, survived the transition from the Medes to the Persians, which is where we first encounter Magi in the Hebrew Bible. So it's, of course, possible that Matthew was in fact referring to Zoroastrian priests known from hoary antiquity, but just as possible, we have lots of evidence from Jewish and contemporary Roman sources from the Hellenistic period and for even the first century CE uh, that magi was a term being used to describe all sorts of people who were interested in astrology and magic and even things like science and medicine. The term magus, which is of course related to our word for magic or magician, seems to be someone who knows arts of some kind that they can use to gain knowledge from nature or manipulate nature in some way. So classic examples of this are Daniel. Um, in, in the Greek version of Daniel, magi show up all over the place. There are all sorts of magi in Babylon. Um, Philo speaks of, uh, uses magi to refer to certain kinds of magicians and soothsayers. Um, Josephus does the same and includes astronomers. Tacitus also describes magi as astrologers. And then we also have magi starting to show up in the book of Acts. We have Simon, uh, Simon Magus is actually one thing he's called, appears in Acts 8. And Elimus in uh, in Acts 13, who is specifically a Jewish magus. So we have a Samaritan magus and a Jewish magus. So this is not exclusively a... Uh, a Gentile phenomenon. So we see, uh, we see Magus's uh, magi functioning in a range of roles in the in ancient literature. That they're dream interpreters, they're magicians, they're astronomers, they're astrologers. They manipulate n- nature with magical practices. Didache specifically forbids being a magus. And we already see that sort of in Acts, right? Right. The two magi in the Book of Acts are both definitely bad guys. Right. Absolutely. And, and they're they're ambivalent figures in most of these texts. You know, Tacitus tells us about about emperors casting the astrologers out of Rome. It seems that they were sometimes seen as troublemakers, particularly if they predicted negative events. So it's it's a bit of a ambivalent category, I think, in ancient literature. Yep. There's a particularly interesting Magus in Second Temple Jewish literature that Brown thinks may be actually informing or lying behind Matthew's depiction of these three magi coming to worship Jesus. And that is Balaam, the prophet from Numbers. Philo, in a life of Moses, and that's relevant because Brown is going to be arguing throughout that the uh, nativity, Matthew's nativity, is structured around Moses. It is it is modeling Jesus after Moses in a really thoroughgoing way. And we'll have to do a Dale Allison episode on 
Jesus as a Moses figure in the Gospel of Matthew to discuss that more fully. But Philo, yeah. in his life of Moses, calls Balaam a magus. So Balaam, this Canaanite or at least non-Jewish prophet in the book of Numbers, is a prophet with authentic insight. He can, in fact, say and pronounce things about the people of Israel that have, that are efficacious. And he is employed by an enemy to destroy God's agent, Israel, but used by God in that act to bring salvation. And Brown sees some strong parallels here with these foreign magi having authentic insight into the birth of the Messiah and being used by Herod to try to kill Jesus, but in fact being used by God to save Jesus from Herod's wrath. Yeah. Another really interesting parallel to note between Balaam and in the Magi in Matthew is the associ their associations with stars and kings. So Balaam in the book of Numbers uh, prophecies that a star will come from Judah. This is understood to be a prophecy of a king. He talks about a king coming from Judah and predicts this over, over Judah. And of course, this is very similar to what we have in the book of Matthew. We have a, a literal star. Uh, we have the birth of a king out of Judah. And, and then we have this uh, magi overseeing both events. So it, it seems like there is probably some deliberate parallels here between uh, Balaam and the magi. So that's just something to, to pay attention to. We'll say a little bit more about the star and the king prophecy in a bit, but that's just to introduce Balaam as a parallel for the magi. As we've discussed, early Christians did not like magic. They did, did not, not like magi. And just to sit on the side here, Mark Goodacre argues that this is probably why Luke omitted the Magi when he retold his nativity story. People often ask, if Luke knows Matthew, why did he not copy over the nativity? And yeah. Mark has pointed out that Magi are the villains in the book of Acts. But that's neither here nor there for today's episode. But it, it is worth noting, though, that once this story enters the Christian mainstream, what to do about people practicing magic is these positive figures in, in Matthew's gospel does become a problem. So both Ignatius and Justin Martyr see this story as a critique of magic and depicting the abandonment of magic. Uh, Ignatius says that the star dissolved all magic. So there's this idea that the magi are... They, they have previously prevent, uh, uh, practiced magic, but now they are repentant of it, and now they are receiving uh, the true light of God. This is a huge stretch <laughs> from what's actually in the text. Uh, there's no indication that the Magi are anything but positive figures, and uh, following the star does get them where they need to go. It's actually pretty effective, and it seems like what's actually happening here is they are successfully integrating their use of star charts and their ability to read uh, astrological phenomena with Jewish text and with Jewish scripture and revelation. So there, it actually seems like this is a positive phenomenon. Right. Uh, early Christian interpreters like to argue that the, the reverence the Magi show for Jesus is their abandonment of their former ways. Uh, but as we see um, in the Gospel of Matthew, the magic leads them rightly. <laughs> um, Brown refers to this as the, the best of pagan lore and religious perceptivity. This is a sort of apparently natural theology working or being eff effective for these magi. So this too suggests to Brown a parallel with Balaam, where we have a non-Yahweh worshiper, someone who is not part of the people of Israel, who is able to, you know, do the work of a magi successfully. And God can use that for his own purposes. The next question we have to deal with in this passage is where are the magi from what is the east matthew just tells us that they come from the east but obviously that seems like a pretty big piece of ground they could be from so where <laughs> where exactly is this where does matthew think the magi are from brown lays out three possibilities for where they might be from and we'll just run through them to give you a sense of what the options are the first possibility is that the magi are from persia and this is of course initially plausible because the traditional use of the word magus to refer to Zoroastrian priests in Herodotus. And Zoroastrian priests are from Persia. And we do see some early evidence in Christian interpretation that supports this. In particular, Clement of Alexandria, 
quotes a unknown letter from Paul. Uh, you can read an article by Brent Landau on this topic. It's very interesting. An unknown letter of Paul in which Paul quotes something called the oracles of the Most High that are supposedly like Persian oracles that describe the dis- the describe a messianic figure, sort of tying it together with these magi coming from the east. Um, likewise, the Arabic infancy gospel depicts these magi as Zoroastrians coming from Persia. The other possibility that's been thrown out is Babylon. Babylon is strongly associated with astrology, particularly in the Hebrew Bible. Daniel depicts magi being present in the Babylonian court. And this also would be a really literarily appropriate place for them to come to. Isaiah 60, once you get into the lighter chapters of Isaiah, there's this depiction of the return from exile when the Jews who were deported to Babylon and throughout the world, the the dispersion, are gathered back. When they come back, they're not alone. They're accompanied by uh, priests and elite figures and kings who come bearing tribute and gifts to bring to Jerusalem. Specifically, the image of the wealthy people of Babylon bringing Babylon's gifts to Jerusalem is a really powerful image that shows up in a lot of Jewish eschatological literature. Matthew would probably see Babylonian leaders bringing gifts to Jerusalem as a confirmation of eschatological prophecies about Israel. And the third option Brown presents us with is Arabia. And if you forced me to answer, give an answer to this unanswerable question, <laughs> I, th- I think Arabia is probably the best bet. And that is just because people from the East, described this way, in the Hebrew Bible, are usually from Arabia. And golden frankincense in several passages in the Hebrew Bible, which are, the, of course, two of the gifts that are brought to Jesus, golden frankincense are strongly associated in Psalms and Isaiah with Arabia. And last of all, the earliest interpretation, the earliest interpreter we have of the Magi, um, which is Justin Martyr, says they came from Arabia. So not that Justin would have had necessarily a particular historical memory, but he may have been able to hear some of these resonances with golden frankincense and the sort of context of the Hebrew Bible in a way that isn't initially obvious to us. And so put these three things together, um, and Arabia is a very plausible option of where these magi are supposed to hail from in the Gospel of Matthew. Finally, we have the question of what is the star? The magi are said to have followed a star from the east to Jerusalem, but what is this? How are we to understand this? Uh, It's worth noting that in ancient literature, uh, portentous births and even portentous deaths are often said to be marked by the appearance of astrological phenomena, including new stars. So it seems like this might be a literary trope that Matthew is drawing on, the idea that when a particularly important person is born, a a star appears in the sky and indicates this is going to happen. Um, But it's also worth noting, this star is not really acting like a normal star, particularly when we get to the Jerusalem-Bethlehem sequence when the star can actually lead people to specific houses. So Stars behaving in this way are not without any parallel or precedent. There are guiding stars in both Virgil and Josephus. Aeneas is guided to the site of Rome's founding by a star. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be some sort of combination of these two things. And it's not that Matthew was sitting down and reading, you know, picked up his copy of Virgil and said, oh, we need some of this action. (laughs) It's more of celestial portents are associated with significant births and stars can guide people places in the ancient imaginary. So that seems to be sort of the, the literary or ideological backdrop for what's going on here. Yeah. People in the ancient world often commonly thought of stars as angels. So this, you know, they move in very predictable patterns. But it's it's worth noting that this can also explain sort of this image of guiding and this imagery of, of leading people in specific important directions. That the, the stars are often thought of as being sentient beings who have wills and are able to do things. The idea of a star leading somebody somewhere, this would not be some sort of bizarre coincidence or cosmological accident this would be a way of the, the heavenlies communicating with humanity that yep. it would make sense if you were an ancient reader dale allison really draws attention to that in an article uh, published in his studies in matthew volume where he yeah. argues that the behavior of this and sort of the expectations for stars in antiquity make interpreting this 
<laughs> so sort of like a comet or something else, kind of unnecessary. This would have been envisioned probably as an angel, and indeed some early Christian interpreters thought of it as such. Right. Uh, Brown lists some options that people have thrown out before about what exactly the new star might have been. Um, he suggests a supernova, which is like an exploding new star that creates a suddenly bright star. Um, another option is a comet. You know, those do tend to appear. And then convergent planets. That's when two planets get very close to each other in the from our perspective. And they create this particular bright spot. Um, Origin actually calls it a, a, a comet. He calls the, the star a comet. One challenge with this is that comets are almost always associated with catastrophes. So the idea that Matthew is imagining a comet doing this, that seems a little less likely. Just to be clear what Brown's doing here, he doesn't actually think there was a particular comet or a convergent planet's what he's suggesting is, so for instance, we know Halley's Comet showed up in about 12 BCE. Likewise, we know there were convergent planets. We can chart, you know, their course sometime in the decade before uh, Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth, based on the death of Herod in 4 BCE, is usually dated to around 6 BCE. And Brown's suggestion is that an author writing, you know, about 100 years later, might mm -hmm. have recalled or might have sources that recall that there were some sort of celestial phenomena going on around the same time and right. associated these two things. Brown's suggestion here is that maybe celestial phenomena, he had some memory knowledge of and plugged this in to roughly Jesus' birth. The other option for where the star came from is, as we said earlier, in Balaam's prophecy in Numbers 24, 17. Uh, we have a few different text types here. Um, it, it's it's worth noting that Matthew doesn't quote this directly, but it does seem to be an inner text. Uh, so here's the Septuagint of Balaam's prophecy. I will point to him, though not now. I bless him, though he has not drawn near. A star will rise from Jacob, and a man will stand forth from Israel. This image of the star from Jacob, the star from Israel, particularly associated with this prophecy over Judah, eventually does come to be seen by many as a, as a messianic prophecy. It becomes particularly important later with Bar Kokhba, uh, mm -hmm. which literally means son of the star, a failed Jewish rebellion in CE 130 that basically puts a hard stop to Jews living in Jerusalem. Yeah, so that's a, so that's another possible source for where this comes from is the the star prophecy in numbers. Yep. If the identification of Balaam with a magus who is mm -hmm. being used in these particular ways by God and God's enemies makes sense to you earlier than <laughs> Balaam's own prophecy about a star and a man from Israel, which was being interpreted messianically, we know, in the time period, sort of makes sense as sort of yeah. the thing lying behind, underneath, or running through Matthew's depiction of the Magi. Right. So, Ian, what are we supposed to get out of this? Why, why does all this matter? Yeah, so Brown argues that the Magi, in contrast to all of Jerusalem responding in fear, and of course Herod and the scribes and the chief priests responding to Jesus with hostility, is Matthew's motif or running pattern of rejection of Jesus by Jewish leaders and acceptance in a few places by Gentiles. So we have Gentiles featured already in the genealogies of Matthew chapter 1. We have parables in Matthew that talk about the kingdom of God being handed over to another nation. Uh, and we have Gentiles like the Canaanite woman and the centurion who accept Jesus. And that's, of course, put in stark contrast to Matthew's harangue about the Jewish leaders, in particular the Pharisees, who get the most negative portrayal of anywhere in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. Although we've talked about it elsewhere, how that's ambivalent with, you know, the teaching of the Pharisees seems to be a good thing. It's just the leaders themselves that Matthew has issues with. The argument here is that the story starts out with, quote, all of Jerusalem rejecting Jesus and three possibly Zoroastrians or mm -hmm. Arabians or, you know, people who are not part of the people of Israel come in and worship Jesus. Yeah. And this Brown is proposing sets a sort of precedent for the pattern of Jesus' rejection by his own people and the gospel going to other peoples. Yeah. It's worth noting here, we really need an Amy Jill Levine show on the social and ethnic horizons of Matthew's gospel. It's worth noting here that there's also more than one way to frame the outsider idea in Matthew's gospel. So I don't, I, I want to push back on the idea that Matthew is setting us up with a very 
strong, Gentiles good, Jews bad dichotomy. Because I don't think that's quite what's happening here. Jerusalem and Jerusalem's leadership in particular is a major site of contention in Matthew's gospel. But what you have once Jesus starts his ministry is the emergence of crowds, which are understood to be drawn from uh, around, particularly Galilee. Uh, these are people who are Jews, uh, but they are backwater Jews. They don't they don't live in the capital. They don't live in Jerusalem. They don't have leadership positions in Israel's government or its religion. And that eventually becomes the backbone of Jesus' support. So it seems like there, there's more than one way to skew to to set up the insider outsider dynamic in Matthew's gospel. Part of it is Jerusalem and the Magi, but that's more complicated than the Jews versus the Gentiles. It's the the likely with the unlikely is another way to read that. So Yeah, I agree. And you can go listen to our episode nine, Graham Stanton, Synagogue yeah. and Church for a treatment of that. And we of course need to do more and we will get our AJ Levine yeah. episode in here eventually. We do. And uh, there's also three um on the YouTube channel, there's also three videos on Matthew's gospel that I've made. So Yep. So Laura, all this talk about Zoroastrian priests. Where do we three kings of Orient I come from? <laughs> so the the shift of the Magi to being described as kings seems to be based on some Old Testament intertext that Psalm 72, 10 to 11 depicts kings bringing uh, tribute to, uh, to Jerusalem. So that's where the idea that the Magi are kings starts to come from. There's no indication in Matthew's gospel that they are kings at all, but th this, this picks up on the psalmic tradition and then, of course, the Isianic tradition of the kings of the world coming to Jerusalem with tribute. So the Magi get slowly transformed in the reception history into kings, even though, according to Matthew, they are not kings. Likewise, there is, of course, no explicit mention of just being three of them. There are three gifts. Mm -hmm. But if you look at early depictions and descriptions of these people, um, our earliest artistic depictions, there are two magi. We have lists of 12 magi and their names in some early sources. And it eventually just settles around three. In, I think, Latin reception in particular, we get three magi who have... A variety of different names. Melchior, uh, Balthazar, and Gaspar are the three that I think people most commonly know. But those are pretty late. Yeah, those are. There are earlier sets of names as well. Three from three different parts of the world uh, starts to show up in the 6th century. It seems like, according to Matthew, the Magi are all from the same place. Uh, when they go back from Bethlehem, they return to their their home by another route. Uh, so the indication is they're all, they all came together and they're all leaving together. But the idea that they came from different places starts to show up fairly early on as a way to communicate the universality of Christianity. So if the if the Magi represent Gentiles, receptive Gentiles, then it, it stands to reason they would come from many places to signify that all of these nations have been brought into the kingdom of God. The three construction is st in the 6th century corresponds to a sort of a three-continent view of the world, where one is from Africa, one is from Asia, and one is from Europe. And, sure, that's fine. So if you've ever seen, um, if you've ever seen, you know, sort of a, a black, a white, and a sort of Middle Eastern looking magi in a painting, that, that's where that comes from. You should Google old maps that have Jerusalem in the center with three continents circulating right. out from them. To see what Laura is talking right. about here. Yeah, that's kind of where that image comes from. This image is also in, um, I've talked about this book slash movie on the show. This is also the image that appears in Ben-Hur. In the book Ben-Hur, the first scene is the three magi coming from their three different continents in meeting fairly close to Jerusalem, where they all realize they've been following the same star. Because, again, they don't know each other. They signify the universality of Christianity. Well, Merry Christmas, Laura. Merry Christmas, Ian. And Merry Christmas to all who celebrate, who listen to our podcast. Thank you for another fun year of listening to our show. And thanks for seeing some, uh, some exciting new developments with us. All right.